everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Seamless Connection podcast. This morning, I'm extremely excited to have with us today Brendan McNamara, CEO of Sound Telemedicine, um, who ha- we have a lot of uh, coworkers in common, colleagues in common. <laughs> but I wanted to start off with before we dove into that conversation. I know Memorial Day is coming up, and Brendan did serve a significant period of time in the military. So, Brendan, first and foremost, thank you for your service. Oh, thank you. Um, and I want to kick it off with just on the personal side, like telling the audience, if you could introduce yourself to the audience from your background, both educational and professional, um, and then maybe kick us into, you've had such a varied background of what brought you into healthcare. Yeah, uh, happy to. So thank you so much for having me, uh, Mina, and the opportunity to, to have this discussion. So my name is Brendan McNamara. I am the CEO of Sound Telemedicine. Uh, as you described, I started, I've been in my, my civilian career uh, in, uh, completely in healthcare for the last 15 years, but I actually started my professional career uh, in the Army, and I had the opportunity to be a paratrooper and work in special operations and uh, deploy for combat operations, etc., uh, and then had this wonderful opportunity to go to bi- business school. And as I reflected on you know, what fields uh, that I wanted to work at uh, from business school, I thought of what brought me joy and purpose in my army career was really this opportunity to sort of serve something greater than yourself and, and believe that you had a cause. And I really found that encouraging about healthcare. And so like, I love the opportunity to think that trying to build new businesses and deliver value, but at the same time, have that opportunity to impact people and really sort of uh, work towards this sort of wonderful outcome, which is better healthcare for, for Americans. Um, and I still kind of get choked up in those, you know, patient stories or anecdotes that we get to start meetings with or start conferences with, with where you really get to see the impact that, that, that you can have and that the innovative care delivery models, et cetera, can have. Um, and so that has been sort of what brought me to healthcare uh, after business school. And as you mentioned, I had sort of a, an interesting set of uh, uh, like an interesting career path. Uh, and it has taken me sort of to all sides of the uh, of the healthcare participants, all with the through line of organizations or entities making the transition from sort of fee for service models of care to value based care. Uh, and I did that starting at a home health agency uh, straight out of business school um, uh, in Nashville, Tennessee, and 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 helped run business development and and. Uh, uh, M and A for for this uh, agency, and then working for a private equity uh, com- uh, portfolio company built for purpose that was trying to help health systems manage their post acute spend more effectively or their post acute operations. Then I uh, got got the chance to serve in in a pharmaceutical services firm and see how pharma thinks about value uh, and articulating the the value of of their therapeutics or their partnerships with clinical providers. Uh, and then got to go to the complete other side of the equation and work for Anth- what was Anthem and is now Elevance Health um, and work for the second largest payer in the country. Uh, and as they thought about how do they manage spend for their membership and how do they push their provider partners more towards value. And then sort of all of that culminated in my, my role here at Sound Physicians, um, where Sound was a, was a really interesting company. At one point, was the largest participant in bundled payment for care in the entire country, um, had about $2.5 billion under spend. And knew that there was there, like there had to be ways to expand our their great model within the hospital setting outside the four walls of the hospital. And so they they sort of launched this telemedicine business, which I've I've now led for the last four years, uh, and we'll get a chance to t- to talk about. But that really was about how could they take a, a value based care model built on a hospitalist practice and leverage that same skills and capabilities uh, into the post acute market, so that we could help improve outcomes and reduce cost. No, and that's that's um, such a fascinating story, especially because as we've all seen, um, costs have continued to explode. Hospitals and health systems have continued to struggle with both operational and clinical um, costs and staffing issues, right across the board. Which obviously telemedicine, as you and I both know well, can do a lot on, on both ends of that equation. Absolutely. So I'm curious to see what have you seen from before the pandemic. Mm-hmm to now mm-hmm. to kind of what you expect to see going forward as kind of steady state, maybe acceptance, maybe just state of the mm-hmm. world for um, acceptance and maybe penetration of telemedicine to help solve both of those key critical issues. Sure. So, you know, I, I, I described sort of in, in jest that uh, COVID to, to me was sort of Dickinsonian and that it was the best of times and it was the worst of times. Um, it was the best of times in terms of, you know, as you can certainly relate, it pushed the acceptance of telemedicine as a sort of viable and effective clinical model 
probably forward by you know 10 to 15 years right over accelerating the adoption of this new technology and care model and all the different ways it could be utilized and so that was a, an incredible tailwind um, but at the same time my sort of core customers and much of my business was skilled nursing facilities and no area of healthcare i would argue was more adversely impacted by the strain first of COVID and the, the the strain for their caregivers and the you know the census decline in skilled nursing facilities, and then the subsequent staffing shortages you know associated with the huge turnover in, in clinical staff around the country, and so when your customers are are very 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 poorly impacted, effectively you're very very poorly impacted, uh, and so it was it was a challenge, and so that we saw like an immediate acceleration and a huge takeoff in in growth due to the, the, of COVID. And then actually like quite a significant low that I would attribute to the, the, the staffing shortages of, you know, these, these skilled nursing facility uh, providers and even my home health customers, you know, they didn't have the staff. They weren't looking for any additional uh, help or resources if, if it wasn't a, you know, a nurse or a CNA. Uh, and now we've seen this enormous uptake again as, people are, are reflecting on like, this is, you know, this is unfortunately the new normal, right? Like this is the world moving forward. And so they're looking for what are cost effective ways that they can sort of add clinical capacity? How can they add staff to augment, the, you know, their onsite clinicians? And, uh, you know, telemedicine is, is just a wonderful, impactful way to do that, right? And it is incredibly cost effective to take, you know, we, the, the precious resource, which today is clinicians, in my case, phys you know, physicians, uh, and, and deploy, deploy them in a way, in a model that allows them to impact lots and lots of facilities and lots and lots of lives in a cost-effective way. Yep, no, that completely makes sense. And then two thoughts immediately jump to mind. So from your, your immediately prior role at Anthem mm -hmm. uh, or previously Anthem was focused on the payer network, mm -hmm. right? And costs and, you know, plans and networks. Um, how did that bring you to sound and how did that bring you to telemedicine at sound more specifically? Yeah, so um, like one of the, so one of the things that I actually spent my time there doing was looking at areas of unmanaged spend for the Anthem population, right? Like where were these pockets of spend? And then look at that from a sort of strategic lens and analyze markets to see, you know, is that solvable? Uh, like, you know, what's the value that we could create for the Anthem mem membership by solving it? And then could we then commercialize that externally, which is similar to the Optum based model? And so it was it was a, a really wonderful and interesting time to analyze different markets. And one of the markets that I spent a lot of time on was the post acute space. You know, we made an acquisition uh, in that space at Aspire while I was there. Um, and I looked at a number of other entities in that space on the like home health utilization management side to SNP utilization management side. And frankly, saw a lot of things that they were sort of, uh, you know, touting a, as like new and innovative ways to sort of control costs were the same things I had done as a home health operator 10 years before. Uh, and so I, I was I was pretty, un, you know, like uh, uh, unimpressed by by many different capabilities uh, and then but thought like sounds model or like their thesis for how they could leverage telemedicine was actually different in that it could sort of every other UM model or uh, uh, you know, model about sort of managing length of stay or those types of things or next site of care, like let's send you to a good sniff rather than a bad sniff. Those are all impactful and they can actually you know, help affect uh, you know, quality and spend. But telemedicine can actually improve performance of a given facility or a given home health agency, right? So it's helping and like move everybody up. And so it's not just saying like, let's send to the good versus the bad. Well, somebody has to go to the bad, right? You know, some uh, uh, patients are still going to those facilities. And so I saw this telemedicine asset as like, we can actually improve, like we can do something different. And it, it was woefully underserved. And, 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 you know, certainly from a physician perspective, like the, the lack of physician engagement on the post-acute side is really remarkable. And when, and when you spend time in the industry, there are, of course, wonderful physicians and, you know, exceptions to the rule, uh, I, I would certainly say. But for the most part, like physicians spend very, very little time in skilled nursing facilities. They spend almost no time in even engaging in home health episodes, let alone, you know, they never go into the patient's house. And so to have a tool, uh, like, you know, a suite of hospitalists that we're lucky enough to employ and a technology that enables us to, like, use those hospitalists in all these sort of ways that wouldn't be cost effective in any other model 
but we can deploy them to add physician capacity, add physician capacity at night. So a night nurse, when they see a fall at two o'clock in the morning, can have a physician on video working with them, you know, within just a few minutes or you know, on our home health side, we actually have our physicians, uh, you know, perform visits at the start of care episodes. Like now there's in a typical home health episode, there's no engaged physicians and we're actually in the patient's home, right? With the nurse, engaging with them, doing medication reconciliation, like all those things to get, you know, make them more comfortable, have a better stay. Um, it, 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 it was tremendously appealing to me and sort of played off my experience set before of knowing that, that, that like post-acute needed, like needed additional improvement uh, to, to, uh, and needed the shift towards value as well. And this is this is such a hugely important topic because, um, as, as, as you know, we work mostly in the acute care space. And while I'm familiar with post-acute, obviously don't know it nearly as well as you, for, and especially for those in the audience that are probably in the same boat or maybe even, even less familiar than I am with post-acute, can you describe kind of just the setting, what you're dealing with, both from a technological perspective, staff perspective, especially the high degree of staff turner, potentially even compared to a hospital setting, mm -hmm. um, as well as just the resources they have. And financially, I know that's been a big question for a lot of people. It's Medicare and unfortunately Medicaid, mm -hmm. which as we know, across the different states, you know, if we think Medicare is yeah. bad for reimbursement, like, so just how, how do you think about all of that coming together in the post-acute setting to hold back care mm -hmm. one? And then secondly, how have you been able to address all those different aspects? So that, so that was like, a wonderful question. And we could probably spend, you know, 30 minutes on my sort of dissertation. But so I think of number one, um, industry wide, there has been a, uh, you know, more and more providers are, are being forced up the acuity curve, right? So patients in a skilled nursing facility today probably would have been in the hospital 15 years ago, but right? like they are taking care of much sicker and frailer patients than they than they would have historically. And home health is taking care of, in many cases, patients who would have been in a SNP 15 years ago, right? So like the residents and the patients in these facilities and in home health are, are you know, increasingly more complex and, and higher acuity. And as you mentioned, um, there, there has been increases in their, in their revenue sources from Medicaid and Medicare, but certainly not um, at the same rate of which they've gone up the acuity curve. So they are very much challenged to provide a higher level of care, be held accountable for say 30 day readmissions or other, or other uh, quality outcomes and have not been sort of given the opportunity to, you know, you know, the reimbursement to hire a lot of additional staff. And so the, that the industry is absolutely being squeezed. Um, and then, you know, like, so in some of these cases, in you know some of these cases, they might ha they might have you know just one RN at night at at nighttime, uh, and then they have CNAs uh, who who cover the residents, um, and they have a medical director. Every skilled nursing facility is, is is required to have a medical director, but that really is sort of an administrative and supervisory role. You know, they're responsible for the clinical programs and the the care of the patients in their facilities, but they don't necessarily see all those patients in many cases they're they're not um you know rounding on those specific patients but it like you would be, like i always think of i had this picture that i took at a skilled nursing facility that i went to of the the physician parking sign um which is always you know sort of like right in front of the of the skilled nursing facilities and it's that you know like you know only the physician can park there I've never seen a physician car parked in that spot. Uh, and so again, like there, there, there's just this lack of, of, of physician oversight. And, um, you know, I, it's not to say that, you know, nurses are, are wonderful at what they do and operating at the top of their license and nurse practitioners are, are an incredible resource as well. But, you know, we fundamentally, or I fundamentally do think that like adding engaged physicians when you're trying to improve quality can only help. Right, and if you can do that in in a in a cost effective way, um, it's 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 really impactful. And some of the outcomes that that we've seen or we've seen in the industry is they're able to improve what historically was you know in the middle of the night again a patient falls or they have a a, a significant change in condition that that you know say the RN on site is going to wake up their physician their medical director in the middle of the night they're going to have a thirty second unsatisfying conversation for both involved and they send them to the emergency room um, and so like that's that was the default that we were trying to help address and use video have physicians awake in front of their computer like ready to help and like 
provide the resource to these clinicians to help treat and manage patients. What are the impacts you're seeing? I know you guys have done a lot of case yeah, studies. Yeah, like, so, If you could share some of those. Yeah, it's inter- so uh, like in, on, on a building by building basis, we've seen some just absolutely incredible results in terms of um, partners that are able to, re- like it sounds absurd, but able to reduce their readmission rates on order of 70 to 80%, uh, you know, over a period of months and enter into new uh, high quality networks, those types of things. On an aggregate basis across all the facilities that we cover, we've we've seen uh, about a 25% improvement um, for those who sort of utilize our service and engage with our physicians versus, uh, uh, you know, a, a cohort of, of facilities that aren't using our program. So it, it can be a it can be a huge difference. Um, but like anything in healthcare, it, it does require some change management and it requires um, you know, the clinical staff doing things in a slightly different way than they, than they have historically. And, and, and that can be a challenge. Uh, and it's certainly something that we, that we work to address and really uh, approach as a change management uh, initiative and sort of, you know, like, how do we help drive that change? And so it's such a key point because we see it in the hospital, acute care hospital setting as well, which if you try and change your clinical workflows or their day to day workflows too much, you're not going to get uptake. Yeah. You're not going to, you're not going to get usage, right? So how do you, and especially, and in, in the post-acute space, it's even magnified with the changeover in staff mm. as well as a lack of resources, right? So how are you managing that both from a technological perspective as well as a staff mm-hmm. perspective in terms of who's your telepresenter yeah. on the other side? Or who do you train if they're potentially leaving every now and then? Um, and I'm curious because for us in the hospital setting, right, we can use a unit secretary or we can use the nursing supervisor or someone. We know that role is always going to mm-hmm. be there. I don't know if it works the same way in the post-acute space. In, like in theory, it does, but in reality, it, it often doesn't. And um, like a data point, the, like the entire healthcare sector lost nurses, right, and clinicians through the COVID crisis. But the skilled nursing facility industry lost four hundred thousand nurses. Um, as like out of how many, roughly? That I don't know, but that's that's more than sort of all the rest combined. Um, that's more than how home health, hospital, hospice, etc. combined was lost on the skilled nursing side. And most of those, like home health is, is mostly recovered. I think inpatients actually mostly recovered. Skilled nursing facilities, that industry is still 300,000 clinicians short. So like the amount, the, the staffing shortage in skilled nursing facilities is so painful. And, and uh, like they were disproportionately impacted by this, you know, evolution or revolution of clinical staffing, right? Uh, and so they're trying to deal with that. And so, you know, to your point, like, how do we make it work in an environment like that? And the key is number one, it has to be as simple and easy as possible. Uh, and then it has to be integrated directly into the clinical workflow. Uh, and so how we did those two uh, together for us is, you know, we partnered with the leading, uh, post, the leading EMR in the post-acute space. And we, we executed an, an exclusive partnership where our telemedicine button is like straight in the patient chart. So right under the patient's picture is a launch telemedicine. And it is about that easy, right? They hit that button, they go to an intake form and there's three questions and then they get connected to a physician. So it was getting that as like simple number one. So it's, it's, you know, it's effectively one button to press and it's in that electronic medical record. So every nurse has access to the electronic medical record, even if they're brand new, even if they're an agency nurse, et cetera they're in the record so they can launch a a telemedicine consult. And then we simplified our training as much as we possibly could and got to, uh, you know, got to a point where we could do sort of like micro training in two to three minute videos of, you know, number one, there's push the button. That part's really easy. Uh, And then, you know, like what is the next steps? Like how, you know, how should you prepare for your, for your consult with the physician? All those things are in these sort of like bite sized flavors of two to three minutes. Um, But to your point, we might train a facility, we might have everything, you know, going great. And then we start to see usage decline and, and follow up and realize because they've turned over, you know, a, a significant contributor of their nursing staff or the DON has turned over uh, and like, or the administrator in these facilities have turned over. So that that's, you know, we think of, we ha- we're constantly having to implement and, and sort of retrain and um, reintroduce our program because realistically, even if we did that every quarter, there would be somebody new on the other side uh, every time. No, 
that completely makes sense. And how, I mean, at this point, would you, for sound telemedicine broadly, is it, um, if you had to give like a percent split of post-acute versus acute care, is it the majority? Is, for sound, is it's about 50-50 for sound telemedicine. Okay. Um, still uh, acute is 50% and post-acute is 50%, but that's, um, will be dwarfed by post-acute. So I, I like, I support about 30 of our, of our customer hospitals. Um, and in via uh, either telenocturnus or cross coverage models uh, on the inpatient side, uh, and and um, but that's relatively flat, like relatively stable. Um, where it's not a high growth uh, engine versus the post acute side, where we're, we're you know growing in the you know ten to twenty percent a month. That's amazing, and that I mean that clearly shows a depth and scope of need. And is this something that where you are again, you no know, understanding the push pull relationship of on site clinical teams and and being integrated and having them think of you as part of their team versus dropping in when they call you because it sounds like they could do it either way. Are you rounding every day, building relationships with the on site teams, or are you just coming in when they need you, like you mentioned, if someone falls? Yeah, or, it's probably a combination of both, uh, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Um, where we can more tightly partner and have that opportunity for this sort of proactive collaboration, I think that is significantly more effective. But in in many cases, it's just that sort of on call support. But we do, you know, we we uh, we we send our progress notes and our, our physician notes directly into into the electronic medical record. We summarize all of our encounters and share that with the SNF uh, clinical and administrative staff on a daily basis. Um, so there is sort of touch points. Um, and uh, we do have uh, like a virtual rounding model that, that we do in some cases uh, as well. But in many cases, like you talk about, we're, we're sensitive to collaborating effectively with the on-site clinical team, but that includes their medical directors or attending physicians. And so we're, we're, we're conscious of sort of not overstepping and, and potentially sort of conflicting with, it, with their you know, care models or, uh, or, or incentives in that facility. And so it's, it's a little bit of a delicate balance of trying to be a, as helpful as we can. And, and frankly, we're sup- like, it's an enormous benefit for those physicians, right? These are physicians that are just as exhausted as every other clinician in the space who now don't get called at night, right? And so, so many of them love it. And in fact, some, in some cases, we're, we're hired by the physicians because they just don't want to take call anymore. Um, uh, but but it's it's a delicate balance, and 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 physicians are are in many cases and rightfully you know protective of their patients and 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 want to make sure that um, they're getting high quality. I think that's where it pays off. That sound you know we're a physician practice, right? I, I'm I'm not a a Silicon Valley tech company who thought they could you know address this. Like we we're a physician practice that's been in business for 23 years. Um, like we have clinical we have quality and outcomes uh, across you know, all of our states, we can show that we're trying to partner and, and just and, and be good clinical partners to these physicians. No, and that makes a lot of sense. And in terms of thinking about um, something you mentioned earlier, and, and also you reflected on now is just incentives, right? Setting it up to be the proper incentives. And you'd mentioned earlier, fee for service models versus value based mm-hmm. models, right? Risk based models. Um, have post-acute space um, facilities taken up value-based care or bundled payments in that respect? Or are you still charging more on a fee-for-service basis and, and looking at it that yeah, way? Yeah, so um, it's, a, it's, it's, it's honestly a little bit of a hybrid. Um, so we do have uh, fee-for-service components of our business um, uh, for sure. But number one, where we create real value is for those risk-bearing entities that are, that are, are avoiding a thirteen dollars to $15,000 hospital admission. Right. Like that's 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 real dollars and real value to the, to those entities. And so sound and uh, and and my business in a number of instances has partnered with risk bearing entities to um, help them and, imp- you know, improve their their clinical and financial outcomes and participate in that value creation. And then we have a number of sort of uh, uh, initiatives that we also do to, to help the skilled nursing facilities make that transition. Uh, and I'm actually at a at a at a long term care conference uh, today, um, and was just presenting uh, about that earlier today. And so, and one of the things is Sound has launched an accountable care organization um, specifically for for patients and that are long term care residents who who live in nursing homes. Um, and so, this is a traditionally you know very high cost. These are these are frail elderly who who live in nursing homes, uh, and and honestly unmanaged because their Medicare fee for service. Um, and, and like nobody is, is, is kind of paying attention to, to their, their overall cost. And so there's a tremendous opportunity there to both deliver a lot 
higher quality care for those patients and really improve their care experience and create some value that we that we then as an ACO share are able to share with uh, physicians who participate in our accountable care organization and importantly with those skilled nursing facilities. And so, you know, we've talked about some, kind of the challenges for the skilled nursing facilities, but it provides them an opportunity to, uh, you know, participate in the value for the care they're already doing, right? In many cases, they're already providing wonderful care, um, but nobody nobody's giving them an incentive for that care. Right. So, they're not getting any credit. Exactly. For and so we're, yeah. you know, we're playing a, 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 like our ACO is playing a small role in sort of helping the industry move forward. But that is increasingly where uh, I think, uh, it, you know, effective organizations in the skilled nursing space are thinking about, you know, we care for a highly, you know, high acuity, high cost patient population in our centers. How do we you know, appropriately take risk or participate in the value associated with delivering good care to those patients. And so that's, that's a constant refrain from, from the industry, but it's, it's pretty early days. That's amazing. I, I can't wait to hear more about how that goes. And I want to be sensitive to time. I could talk to you for another hour easily, but I know you've got to go. Um, I wanted to thank you for your time this morning and, and I hope we can follow up with a deeper conversation. But I've loved learning more about kind of how you uh, and, and sound telemedicine overall are kind of revolutionizing care in the post-acute space. Because I know that's an area that is all too often overlooked. And yet we see the impact of that um, of that. Um, if overlooking is a word uh, of that overlooking when the patients bounce back to the hospital. Right. And we see them, we're like, this didn't have to get this far. Right. And it sounds like you're helping address that problem, that problem which is amazing. Absolutely. Thank you so much. It was, it was a, it was a great pleasure to, to speak with you today and thank you for the opportunity.